<coughs> so, does it work? Okay, okay. So, uh, so thank you very much to <coughs> Wolfgang Schirmacher and, and uh, for inviting me and to all of you, uh, to all of you. So, and thank you very much, of course, especially for giving me the opportunity of speaking one hour more. You know, this day. <laughs> Well, uh, the, title, the title of my presentation is Literary Communities. Well, just a, just a first remark for me, a literary community is not a community of writers, not a community of people who do, enjoy, or teach literature. It's a community framed by the literature. This formulation requires some precisions regarding the two terms, community and literature. As I understand it, a community is not a reunion of persons sharing a common identity. It is a certain fabric made of things that individuals can perceive as constituting their lived world of names under which they can identify them of forms of identification of the situations, events, and meanings which make those individuals share a certain common sense. Literary community is a form of construction of such common sense. The point is not only about the character that a literary plot uh, gathered, but about the weaving of a sensible common fabric within which characters can be individualized and relations between characters constructed. Weaving a common fabric thus doesn't simply mean inventing spaces and situations within which characters are interconnected. This first means inventing patterns of unity and multiplicity and forms of relation between two patterns of unity. The pattern which is isolates units called character or event and the other which links a multiplicity of characters, situations and events to constitute a work as a whole. The creation of such communities is made by words. In that sense, the notion of literary community goes far beyond the production of an art named literature. In a sense, literary community exists whenever human beings are gathered by the power of certain words. And in that, <clears throat> and, uh, for instance, a religious community structured by the obedience to the word of God, or a political community shaped by the power of some, some words like liberty or equality, are literary communities in that sense. And literature is an implementation of the broad literary capacity of the human animal. But it's also a specific form of that implementation. Literature, for me, is not the whole made by all the pro works produced by the human art of writing. It is a historically determined regime of identification of that art, which belongs to what I call the aesthetic regime of art. Therefore, when I, when, I shall, when I speak of literary communities in the narrow sense of the word, I speak of the forms of construction of the common that are specific to literature as a historical form of the art of writing. Now, it's clear that the historicity of literature is not simply the historicity of an art. It is the historicity of a form of implementation of the literary capacity of the human animal. The practice of literature sets to work a regime of presentation of facts, of connection of events, and production of significations, a sense of the totality and the individual, in short, a whole regime of perception and interpretation of experience, which exceeds the limits of a specific art. This means that the communities constructed by literary practice have also something to reveal about the ways of making common words at work in social life and political practice. So this is the wide scope, you know, of my investigation, though its immediate object tonight is to examine some problems regarding the forms of construction of the common characterizing literature as a historical regime of the art of writing. As it turns out, the novelty of literature as a new regime of the art of writing is not something that was proclaimed by historical manifestos. Instead, it was perceived in a respected way, and mainly through, crit uh, through, uh, through the, the judgment of critics, who only saw its characteristics as the peculiar shortcomings of individual writers or specific direct school. This is notably the case with the criticism leveled in France in the 1850s, 1860s, against the writer 
who was considered the champion of the so-called reality, reality school, namely Gustave Flaubert. Such criticism, in fact, specifically targeted two main shortcomings, which, in fact, concern the two main characteristics that define a fictional community. The community of characters that constitutes the space of fiction, and the community of between events that defines its forms of rationality. Flaubert was blamed, firstly, for his incapacity of constructing his fictions as a whole, then <coughs> for his incapacity to select his characters. First, said, said one of his colleagues, he proved unable to build an intellectual connection of events. He, has only, he only composed tableaus and nailed them together. So, um, quotation, there is no book there, it's about sentimental education. There is not this thing, this creation, this work of art constituted by a book with an organized development. It goes without a plan, pushing ahead, without a preconceived overview, not being aware that life, under the diversity and the apparent disorder of its vagaries, has its logical and inflexible laws. It's a loitering, loitering among the insignificant, the vulgar, and the abject for the sole pleasure of the walking." End of quote. Now, this incapacity was strictly connected by the critics with another one. There were, too, there were too, uh, incapacity of selecting characters. There were too many people and things in his books. And what's worse, too many insignificant people. People who cluttered up the space of fiction and hindered the deployment of outstanding feelings and actions. This overpopulation was, the, was, they said, the mark of democracy in literature. It was exactly opposed to the selection of characters and situations which characterized the fiction of aristocratic times, in which, quote, the characters embodying all the refinements of birth, education, and the art left no room for secondary figures, still less for material objects. This exquisite society saw ordinary people only through the doors of its carriages, and the countryside only through the windows of its palaces. This left wide and fertile scope for the analysis of the finest sentiments, which are always more complicated and harder to de decipher in the souls of the elite than amongst the lower classes." End of quote. On, <clears throat> on the contrary, the new realist school, epitomized by Madame Bovary, has, uh, has no wall separating the inside from the outside, which means that, that it has no principle of hierarchy. Everybody and everything has an equal importance. Quote, all characters are equal, the farmhand, the groom, the beggar, the kitchen maid, the chemist's assistant, the grave digger, the tram, the dishwasher, take up a huge space. Naturally, the things around them become as important as them. Only the soul could make the difference, but in this literature, the soul doesn't exist. End of quote. What I think the critics, uh, so the critics, that, that, you know, by criticizing one specific author on, or one specific school, made a strict connection between two shortcomings. The new literary school <coughs> could not give to a novel the unity of the whole because it could not select the individualities that are the components of this whole. My point is that what, has, what is at issue there, not the opposition of two literary schools, but an opposition between two ideas of the whole, the one and the whole, two ideas also about what an individual and an event are, two regimes of the art of writing, <coughs> which are two regimes of interpretation of experience and construction of a common sense. What those, crit those critics witnessed then is not only the bourgeois anxiety you know, of the time in front of the so-called egalitarianism, you know, sweeping across society and literature. They epitomized the opposition between the logic of the representative regime of the arts, to which the old practice of the belles lettres belonged, and the logic of literature. Sentimental education, said the critic, is not a book because it doesn't obey the, the idea of the whole that makes a work of art. What is this, this idea of the whole? The, the, the idea of this idea of the, of the whole, in fact, dates back to Aristotle's poetics. What makes a poem, Aristotle said, is a construction of a fiction. A fiction is an arrangement of actions according to necessity or verisimilitude. This link, this causal linkage, according to necessity or verisimilitude, is what makes the poetic plot a whole. 
This is what opposes poetry to history, which, he says, only tell events as they happen in their particularity, one thing after the other. From this opposition, Aristotle drew a consequence. What is important, what constitutes the fabric of the novel, is the arrangement of events that makes a whole. The words and attitudes of the characters are defined by this arrangement and not by their own personality. But this privilege of action over characters has a correlate or a flip side. Such actions can only concern individuals who themselves live at the level of the whole, individuals able to conceive of great ends and try to reach them at the risk of facing the strokes of fortune. They cannot concern people who live in the universe of the one thing after the other, people to whom events just happen one after the other. The distinction between poetic causality and historical or empirical succession is also a distinction between two forms of life and two classes of human beings. The wholeness of the work is linked with a certain configuration of the community, certain distribution of forms of life separating two kinds of human beings. This is why in, 18, in 17th century France, the Aristotelian hierarchy between events and characters could be subverted and action could be redefined as a conflict of passions, those passions that could only be felt by the souls of the elite, in short, by persons of a high rank. This doesn't mean that ordinary people were excluded from the universe of fiction, but they were given specific places and roles or included in specific genres, low genres of fiction. The fictional community then was the hierarchical community, defining what individuals could feel, say, and do according to their place, to their place and their identity. It is this connection between the formal principle of linkage and a substantial hierarchy of forms of life that was shattered by the emergence of literature as such. The critics denounce denounced it as democratic subversion. But what does it, that subversion exactly mean? For them, it meant that everything and everybody was given the same importance. But this is obviously not the case. No. Uh, in Madame Bovary, for instance, all characters are not equal at all. Emma Bovary is the character around whom all things and all bodies you know, re revolve. So the point, is, the point is about the kind of individuality that she embodies and the kind of revolution in the literary sense of the word, the kind of revolution of things and bodies linked with that individuality. And so I shall examine those two points in turn. Firstly, Emma Bovary is not simply the figure of the anybody which has the same importance as anybody else. She is the figure of the anybody who affirms her capacity to experience any form of life. And or more precisely, to experience from the form of life which was reserved to the souls of the elite, to the exquisite society feeling and expressing the refinements of ideal passion. Now, this affirmation is itself the embodiment of a certain literary power, the power of words which provoke a split within the existence of those people who were destined to the repetitive life of the everyday. Something has happened to her, Something that it shows that she sums up, up herself in a few words that she has read in novels, novels not destined to persons of her condition, such as those three words, felicity, passion, and ecstasy. What do they mean? And how is it possible to, uh, well, to, to, embody, to embody those words? So her individuality is the individuality of the child of the book, dedicating his life or her life to the embodiment of a few words. The form of equality that he represents, so, is not the kind of indifferent leveling described by the critics. It is the disruption of the normal distribution of forms of life. The new novel is constructed around a certain figure of the anonymous. The anonymous as a figure of the literary animal. The peasant's daughter who wants to change her life by experiencing the truth of some words scrapped from books destined to the souls of the elite, belong to the same family as the emancipated workers who rethink the everyday constraint of their work out of the words describing the pains of the romantic heroes who have no place in society, or 
the revolutionaries who appropriate for, them, for their struggle the tropes of ancient rhetoric. A sotore is part of a wider affirmation of the capacity of the anonymous, or, in my words, of the power of taking part, belonging to those who have no part. This power works through operations of disidentifications, individual, individuals who were identified as occupying a certain place in the social hall and destined to a certain form of life, break away from that identity. So this, uh, this is um, the power of the anonymous is the power of disidentification for which individuals break away from the universe of invisible repetitive life to which they were destined. By, and they do it by setting to work capacity that don't fit their identity. Now comes the, say, now, 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 now comes the, 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 the thing. How is, how, how is this singularity singled out? And how is it articulated in the fabric of the novel? What form of linkage of individual and events does this singling out entail? To answer those questions, I propose that we look at the most famous an episode in the book, an episode which, which has been emblematic, which has become emblematic of a new mode of construction of fiction. The episode that tells the birth you know, of the romantic, of the love of the romantic Emma for the seducer, for the seducer, you know, of the village, Rodolf, amidst the agitation of the agricultural meeting. The seducer, Rodolf, displays a whole arsenal of words and attitudes obeying the classical logic of ends and means, you know, to seduce to seduce Emma. But it is not this causal construction that makes him win. The birth of Emma's love happens as the effect of a chain of, a chain of sensory events which happen one after the other, without their aggregation being the effect of any design. The heat of a summer afternoon, the voices of orators whirling in the air, the murmur of a crowd, the bellowing of the oxen, the bleating of the lambs, small golden lines radiating from black pupils, the perfume of vanilla and citron, a long trail of dust dragged by a stagecoach, the memories of a valse and, the, and of old vaults and of old desires whirling like grains of sand under a gust of wind, whose last consequence is that her end, her end of course, lets itself be seized by another end, and of course the end of the seducer. So the individual love, you know, is described, is described you know, as a consequence of a multiplicity of microsensory events, carried into a broader fluid made of words read in books, images seen in, on plates, colored vignettes on prayer books or keepsakes, perfumes of the altar or rhythms of sentimental ballads. In other terms, the disruptive egalitarian individuality is reconstructed by the writer as a manifestation of a new form of common sense. If anybody can, can want to live any form of life, and notably to, to feel the fine sentiments of felicity and passion, you know, previously reserved to the souls of the elite, it is because those fine sentiments are no more the dispositions of individual souls. There are crystallizations of an impersonal life of sensation going through them. What structures then the new literary common sense community is a new form of common sense, made of a whirlwind of impersonal sensory events, a life of the soul, which has nothing more to do with the souls of the elites, since it is an impersonal community of events, a perpetual movement as randomly assembling an infinity of atoms that get intertwined, part with one another and get interlaced again in a perpetual vibration. It is from such a random com combination of impersonal events that the individuality of the individual is composed, or rather, this individuality I mean, the narrative individuality, of course, is a conjunction of two processes. On the one hand, it is this combination of sensory events. On the other, it is an identity defined by some narrative functions corresponding to social forms of ident identification, being a member of a social class, an inhabitant, an inhabitant of a little country town, a daughter, a wife, a lover, etc. Therefore, the story of the anyone trying to live the life of ideals and passions formerly reserved to the souls of the elite 
becomes the stories of an individuality participating in two forms of common sense. The common sense of the impersonal dance of the atoms and the common sense defined by the distribution of social identities. The character is defined at the junction of, his, of those two words, but it is also defined by Flaubert by the impossibility of perceiving that duality. Emma is unable to single out the impersonal tissue of events that makes her love. She reinterprets this random combination of impersonal events in terms of identity and causality by making them the manifestations of her personal love for another person. And this is how she becomes prey of the social logic, of the social logic. So this mean, uh, what happens is that the writer has retained for, him, has retained for himself, or rather for his writing, the power of the anonymous transformed into the power of the impersonal. He retains, for, he retains as the power of writing the power of unfurling for itself the life of the impersonal <coughs> by constructing a specific form of egalitarian community, the equality of the sentences, each of which conveys the power of the whole, the power of the common press within which all sensory events are carried. So this means that the literary revolution in this case performs a very specific operation in relation to the subversive manifestations of the power of the anonymous. It separates that power of disidentification from the agents who implement it. The power of the anonymous is no more located in the affirmation of those who want to live a life that is not their life. It is located in the float of the macro events, producing those affirmations as singular forms of crystallization of the impersonal. So literature turns the power of disidentification into the power of writing itself, the power of dissolving for its own sake the forms of social identity and relationships in order to produce its own events in the breast of the sentences while letting the characters on the bad side of individuality, the side which makes her or him the prey of stereotyped sentiments and social conventions. Well, in other, in other terms, it can be said in the traditional terms that the literary form explores the power of a new community, the community of the anonymous, while the fictional content is given by another community, the community defined by the normal relations between individuals resulting from social and narrative conventions. The literary community is thus constructed as an articulation of two forms of common sense. The common sense of the plot as an arrangement of actions determined by a set of relations between social identities and the common sense of the sentences themselves, conveying a flow of perceptions animated by the egalitarian breath of the in-person. Well, in her essay on modern fiction, Virginia Woolf made the conflict of the two forms of common sense explicit, as she overturned the opposition made by the critic of Flaubert between materialism and spiritualism. In her view, the materialist writers are not those who describe you know, prosaic reality. They are those who stick to the social, tyrannical logic of the plot with its arrangement of actions and norms of very similitude. Those writers, she says, seem constrained by some unscrupulous tyrant to provide a plot, to provide comedy, tragedy, love interest, and an air of probability embalming the whole so impeccable that if all his figures were to come to life, they would find themselves dressed down to the last button of their coast in the fashion of the hour. End of quote. So to this social distribution of characters and arrangement of events, she opposes the truth of life. Life, she says in, in this well-known text, is a luminous halo, a semi-transparent envelope surrounding us from the beginning of consciousness to the end. It consists of an incessant shower of innumerable atoms that come from all sides. So the task of the new fiction is to record the atoms as they fall upon the mind in the order in which they fall. So the representative whole conceived as a kind of organic body is a lie. What is true, what is the truth of life is precisely the, the, the succession, the, the succession you know, of the, is the shower of the atom. It is a community of the atoms, the patterns that they drew 
under the name of individual feelings. From this point of view, the construction of the Flaubertian novel looks like a compromise, a compromise because Flaubert was the first, probably, to raise the main problem of modern fiction. What kind of common fabric of persons and events can be weaved once the old hierarchical distribution of forms of life, which circumscribed the space of fiction, has been shattered? How can the luminous halo of life be reconciled with the organic link of the fiction with a beginning, a development, and an end, which also means a story of whales, actions, successes, and failures. Flaubert proposed a solution that became canonical for, for modern fiction. There is no solution at the level of the whole. The solution has to come from the one after one and one after the other. Not only at, at the level, you know, at the level of the particular, but through it. And the solution is, and the solution that he, that, that he invented and that was uh, after him, you know, you know that, that was in, uh, take, uh, to, to taken up after him, is to give a twofold function to the thread of narration, which means mainly the thread of the sentences. The thread of narration must also be a bridge between two words, as it links a sentence with another sentence and a narrative even with another one, it must also bridge the gap between the logic of the impersonal connections of life and the logic of narrative action, which is a logic of personalization and of causal relations between individual wills and acts. So the logic of succession and the logic of action must slide imperceptibly on each other. The writer inserts the vibration of the power of the anonymous in the interstices of the plot of love and money. That vibration produces the imperceptible deviation that changes from the inside the mode of production of the narrative action. But the thing can be put the other way around. The expression of the luminous halo is incorporated in the inner, in the inner vibration of the phrases, the better to be enslaved in, to the tyranny of the plot, chronicle of the everyday, village intrigues, imaginary love stories, and real money worries. So the absorption of the power of disidentification in the respiration of the sentence results in a new subordination to the power of the, of the plot tyrant. Is it possible then to imagine a form of literary community free from the power of the tyrant? And what form of inclusion of the power of the anonymous is implied by that form of community? That question is at the core of the attempts of the author of the essay, Virginia Woolf herself. How articulate the life of the halo, the construction of singularities and the construction of the work with a beginning, a middle and an end. How do it without sacrifice, sacrificing the, the power of the anonymous, either by absorbing this power into the breath of the sentence or by submitting the democracy of anonymous life to the tyranny of the plot. Virginia Woolf's work explores the paradox raised by this program in two directions, which proved to be, uh, to, to be in a way unsuccessful. On the one hand, the short story, uh, one, of, uh, one of, of a short story, an unwritten novel, sets out, sets out to draw the whole of a story from, the, from one face, the face <coughs> of an anonymous woman met in a train. As the story's teller, as the story's teller, so in, in the train, is struck by the expression of unhappiness of on her face, and, and, and struck by the vain attempts of the woman to rub a stain on the window pane, she sets out to read that face, to decipher its secret, and the secret appears to, appears to be the negligence who made the young woman cause the death of a child, as she was lingering in a draper's shop fascinated by trays of colored ribbons. Then after, the humiliation suffered at her brother's home, the cruelty of her sister-in-law, etc. And, and the story, and the story so, so, so moves, moves on in this way. But as the story is completed, the train reaches its terminus. At this moment, you know, what the storyteller sees is that the poor, lonely creature is just a happy mother that her son welcomes at the station. Well, the lesson of the story is not about the opposition between reality and imagination. It's about the way in which the anonymous can be individualized and work as the principle of 
construction of a whole of narrative events. The presence of the anonymous in the literary fabric cannot be the revelation of its secret. The will to read the face of the anonymous re-establishes the tyranny of the plot. So the face must be present, but there must be, there must be a mediation between the singularity of the unknown face and the whole of the community of literary events. A mediation working as both a passage and a separation. So this is for the first attempt. Well, now the second attempt. In the opposite direction, there is the attempt, there is the attempt at constructing the whole as made of singularities that are, that are mere sensory events. And the second section of one of well, uh, the best known, you know, Virginia Woolf's novel, To the Lighthouse, proposes an example of this solution. It describes the life of the house during the long absence of, the, of its inhabitants. So a life which is entirely impersonal at last. A life which is only constituted by so the wind blows or the trails of dust, which now stand up as narrative events instead of the becoming of the sensation of becoming the sensations of a woman. The only characters playing in the house are little elves venturing indoors, toying with flapping wallpaper, creating wood or tarnished and crack and cracked china. The only events are a boat springing on the landing, the fold of a shawl swinging to and through, a thistle thrusting itself between the tiles, and so on. So the events of that impersonal life of elves and dust, or reflex in pools on the beach, is explicitly counterposed to the events that mark the course of human beings and are the ordinary matter of plots, notably stories of marriage and death. That, in the, that are given by the narrator in that section, now and then, three lines, three lines, you know, between this line inside square brackets. And those square brackets emblematize the full separation between the life of the impersonal, which is the stuff of modern fiction, and the events of personal life, which were the stuff of the old fiction. But they emblematize as well the artifice of that separation. The community of sensory events cannot have a full autonomy. The events of the novel must be microsensory events happening to characters that at the same time live the normal life of individuals making plans to achieve their ends, a marriage or a divorce, a degree course at the university, a performance or a party. Again, there must be some kind of window, both transparent and opaque, that must be set up between the domestic chain of events and the dispersion of anonymous life. The, the construction of the literary community thus appears as the articulation of three terms, the individual, the multiple, and the whole. 